This presentation is brought to you by Brilliant at Brilliant.org, where we are bridging the digital divide for the blind. The following is a recording of an interview with the Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind in Silver Spring, Maryland, conducted by Brilliant.org on October 19, 2018. Anyway, uh, Vincent, the, yes. the reason we're here, and uh, if you don't mind, do you mind if I record this? Just uh, we like to put things like this on our website and. Give me your intent first, and then I'll okay. be able to. Okay. Our intent is just information and mm -hmm. to introduce ourselves. It's not we're not trying to sell you anything sure. or do anything. We just want to find out a little bit more about what the Columbia Lighthouse does. Well, I'm and glad to. And we're it. trying to so. raise awareness to people who don't know. Perfect. Is that okay? Absolutely. Go for oh, it. Oh, good. And we might post this on our, you know, one of our blogs or something like that. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Good. All right. Well, good. We're uh, this is uh, Chris Whitehead and Taylor Runyon with Brilliant.org, and we're here today with Vincent Cotton, and he's the senior director of technology and training at the Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind in um, Silver Spring, Maryland. So we're excited to be here. Thank you for taking a few minutes to talk with us, Mr. Cotton, and we uh, we surely appreciate your time. I know it's uh, late on a Friday afternoon, probably ready to go home, but. Um, tell us a, a little bit about the kind of technology that you're involved with here at the Columbia Lighthouse. Well, thank you, first of all, for stopping by. It's a great uh, pleasure to meet both of you. And uh, I will also see if my assistant director of uh, technology is in. Her name is Nia D'Amato, and she um, particularly specializes in serving our uh, deafblind population um, but she also provides a lot of direct service as well. And she'll also be able to talk about, about um, certain of the tools that, that we use. <clears throat> we commonly use uh, most of your mainstream um, tools. Like JAWS, NVDA, Window Eyes, Absolutely. Supernova. Yes, and, and to that point, thank you for mentioning all of those because we we provide an assessment first. Uh, we want to know what the goals of the learner uh, are, and we want to build a training approach that will help them uh, achieve those goals. And in that assessment, we're identifying what the primary learning media is and identifying what their present level of performance is as a touch typist, what their understanding of computers, be it a PC or a Mac, and just their whole... I'm a Mac. I'm a Mac fan. So. Are you? <laughs> yes. And so you probably could run circles around me. I know enough <laughs> to get out of trouble for most instances, but I... I know with voiceover it's a lot of buttons because you have to hold the control option keys as well as many other keys to, op to activate certain functions and blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I was able to learn it, um, and I'm able to use it. Now, how old are you, may I ask? I am, a, I am 13. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so let me ask you this. Uh, uh, sorry I interrupted you, no but, I, but uh, I just wanted to find out some more information about what you do in terms of what you just mentioned. Yes. When you provide this, these services, are, is this on an individual basis, or are you doing this on a group? We, we do have the capacity to deliver both group and individual uh, okay. training environments and again that's also based on what is best for that learner. Okay. Um, while we offer groups we don't just force in, an individual into a group setting just because we have a group for that particular uh, topic whether it's touch typing or any other of our uh, courses we offer. Okay. Now do you do online courses or online uh, teaching? Right now all of our courses are offered face-to-face -face, whether they be in our uh, facilities or in the person's home or a community uh, space. Okay. Okay, because we're trying to allow it so that anybody can really learn because some people don't have the ability to drive all the way here and most of the people like me if they're blind <laughs> Um, they can't even drive a car anyway. Wait a minute. <laughs> you not driving yet? I'm blind. I can't drive. You had me fooled. I thought you had one of those self-driving Maseratis out uh, front that you that just left there and said, I'll be back. No, um, not yet? Okay. Chris, Chris, um, 
He he's he is he was our driver. Okay, all right. Well, so we have one blind and one sided. You you'll be driving in the future. <laughs> in I, the future. I, I have high hopes that um, with the fast proliferation and social acceptance of self driving vehicles, I think we'll definitely see that in your lifetime so, and mine. Yeah, so sure. part of our organization is the whole point. I what um, I would also like to be able to be able to drive, be involved in the driving experience, as well as not crash into something. So <laughs> I would like to develop something where if you have to if you have to turn left to avoid something, it'll vibrate the left part of your seat, and if you have to turn right, you it'll vibrate the right part of your seat, and it and it'll do it more and different in different intensity levels depending upon how much you have to turn. That that's that's a that's a very creative mind you have. <laughs> as well as well as voice prompts. And I encourage you to continue uh, your development and continue to share that message. I do know that there are several approaches being considered for uh, how to alert a driver who is participating in the driving process. Most of the self-driving technology that is being developed now, though seeks to not necessarily have involvement from the person sitting behind the wheel. The intent is to equip vehicles with enough radar and other sensors to be able to uh, avoid and maneuver around uh, obstacles, be they static obstacles in the middle of the road or a moving obstacle like um, cars that are trying to merge into a lane um, and one of the initial uh, developments can be viewed, um, and to your point, Taylor, um, the Blind Driver Challenge in 2008 uh, was an, uh, an initiative uh, that was uh, co-sponsored by the NFB and uh, a school in Virginia, Ford. And what happened uh, was that Mark Riccobono, who is now uh, the president of the National Federation of the Blind, uh, drove drove a vehicle, and Mark is blind. <clears throat> yeah. I was just with him last Friday, as a matter of fact. He's still mm -hmm. blind. <laughs> do you and know Rachel, by the way? Rachel Olivero? Yes, from I do. Okay, yeah, yes. we, we talked to her a couple weeks ago. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. So he drove, and this is on YouTube, so you can see. Uh, he drove a lap around Daytona Motor Speedway, and he was driving a vehicle that was equipped to give him indicators as to how to avoid <clears throat> planned and unplanned obstacles that were on the track. Wow. So we've seen the advancement of the technology and thought into the technology. And Taylor, I think that in a mode that perhaps might be available in certain vehicles, there may be the option for uh, the driver to- Sided and blind? Yeah, to participate in the driving experience, meaning um, you know, there, there may be some prompt to apply brake, you know, but the idea right now is to have a fully autonomous scenario where the vehicle is, is operating on its own. Yes. An now, another, another development is um, something similar to, are you familiar with like Ira and Be My Eyes? Be My Eyes, I'm familiar with that a little. So that concept is being integrated into some self-driving technologies where basically someone is sitting at a console, Chris, uh, like this computer perhaps with a joystick, and actually maneuvering a vehicle, being the sighted uh, operator. Okay, um, okay. And, and so that is also a development that um, is, is, is being integrated into some of the systems and approaches. Almost um, like drones. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's actually the technology that started all this. Right. Um, so unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs, mm -hmm. um, obviously the military has had this capability for quite some time and um, it has now been released, if you will, to the commercial markets. Um, so we're excited about what we believe will, will, will come out of all this development and uh, and so, Taylor, again, I believe that in your lifetime, certainly mine too, we'll, we'll be behind the, the wheel if we choose to be. Um, so, uh, Mr. Cobb, yes. if we could get back to the, sure. your training for just a minute. Sure. I, I think you're absolutely right about all of that. Mm. But I, I wanted to ask you what, what levels, what um, age levels that you 
focus on in terms of this training? Is it children all the way through uh, elderly adults, or um, is it just one specific age group? Maybe we we like to kind of put it a, a put a nice uh, bow on this package by saying we we serve anyone, anyone who can who can benefit from the training. Okay. So in terms of age, we do have an early intervention uh, specialist who works with children six months to five years. Uh, however, when individuals uh, are able to benefit from, from our training, we consider that uh, they have all of the capacity to, to, to benefit. Okay, and is there a cost to this for? All of our training is free. Okay. We do, however, receive support in a variety of ways. Uh, we're a private nonprofit, and so we are who the state agencies and municipalities in the area outsource to. So we provide services on behalf of quite a few stakeholders. Okay. And they either will grant us uh, funds or we have relationships where we have uh, a variety of vehicles, <coughs> excuse me, that we use. Um, they will authorize services for us to train their client base and um, when there is no funding source in place, that's why we have our fundraisers like our upcoming gala, uh, where Christina Ha, who won Gordon Ramsay's uh, Top Chef competition, chef competition last year, right. will be our featured um, chef that night, uh, along with a few special guests that are, are certainly um, some added highlights to this to, to this event. Um, so please. Uh, Check out our website for more information about that gala that's happening okay. in December. So one more, one more question. Sorry for interrupting no and starting us down another rabbit hole. <laughs> rabbit hole. Uh, so, do you have any an affiliate program? So affiliate programs in the traditional sense, no. Um, we do have um, we provide itinerant services. Uh, but and we work with certain individuals who are contractors for us but an affiliate in the sense that we have satellites where we have individuals who are operating under our name and following our paradigm our models for training and so forth and so on we, we don't um, <coughs> all of the lighthouses in the country are autonomous meaning they operate uh, in and of their own so they're not connected. Direction. They're not connected to anything. We else. are connected only in the sense that most of the lighthouses in the U.S. are member agencies of the National Industries for the Blind, which means <coughs> that um, there are certain supports that the NIB provides to member to its member agencies. They have a wide variety of GSA schedules, which are certain agreements between a vendor and the government that allows that vendor to provide a service or product to the government at a fixed uh, at a fixed rate so you need those in order to secure certain kinds of contracts um, a lot of them have to do with manufacturing uh, but there are some that are getting into more technical and professional skill categories uh, so to 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 that point that uh, we don't have affiliates in the traditional sense no Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is mm. I am making videos on some devices that I have yes. to try to teach people who cannot go to any of the places, uh, any of the lighthouses or NFBs or, a, uh, or APH to get training so that people who, can, who cannot do that, so uh, uh, blind elderly, for example, yes. who uh, are in a nursing home connected to some monitors either way um, they people who cannot who cannot travel mm -hmm. they can still access it with my videos <clears throat> I do videos on variety of products like JAWS, uh -huh. NVDA, Magic, iPhones, um, iPhones uh -huh. and sometimes I'll do connected videos where we're, t where we're talking about two devices uh -huh. um, and using those two devices uh, respectively. Uh -huh. Like I did last, last uh, my last one was uh, talking about how to connect my Braille Note Apex to my iPhone 6S and uh -huh. use it as a Braille display for voiceover. Uh -huh. 
And so that was working with two devices, working with a how to you do it, and I purposefully made errors uh -huh. to show them how many possible things could go wrong. Uh -huh. Okay, excellent. Well, one more question. Thank you. Um, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge in terms of technology for, for the blind and visually impaired at this point? I think one of the biggest challenges regarding technology, period, is the rate of obsolescence. The speed at which one device is no longer uh, relevant to the majority, and then what typically happens is it becomes unsupported by the developer. Like um, humanware. We, uh, we, were, we ran into that problem at one point, didn't we? Yeah, so, humanware, um, Victor Reader Stream, first generation. Mm -hmm. yes. They discontinued that. They did not discontinue the Apex. They still, they they made their last software update, Keysoft 9.5.0 in 2015, but they're still supporting um, support. So you can still call them and say, there's something wrong, I need this fixed, blah, 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 blah. But they will not do any updates or, in, or, or do any features. Most of them is uh, going towards the Braille No Touch. And that'll stay, that'll stay consistent uh, as long as, and so they're basing that on their knowledge of the market, how many people they know still own and use BrailleNote Apexes. Additionally, the, the touch operates, as you know, on in a, Android, right, as its base operating system, whereas the Apex uses Keysoft. Actually, it's it's a Windows CE as its base operating system, and the Keysoft is placed on, on top of it. And and the point to that is, is that when there becomes some security feature or something that would jeopardize the the uh, the safety of say the Apex, we'll continue to see them support uh, the updates. device. Yeah. Uh, so those I don't know. I would say updates, but I would say they will continue to at least support those who continue. To, use to it. own and use them, yes. Like they, you could still probably buy one. Yes, uh, I'm certain you can find most items from surplus holders and things like that. But so, the issue that I see could be summed up in a multifold perspective. There is that that issue of obsolescence uh, or the rate of obsolescence. So the the thing that's the most important to that discussion is. When, when you're wanting to compete, and that's what this is all about, right? I, I tell all of my learners, you want to be able to have access to information so that you can be involved. Um, but ultimately, if you're looking to work or to, you know, to educate yourself, uh, it's because you want to compete for a job or you want to build a business that will compete with other providers of your service or product and what impacts your ability to have that leg up or that edge is how powerful is the technology and other resources you're using in your, in your in your life whether it be business or personal so you know when you look at you learn mm -hmm. how to use a, a, a 6 an iPhone 6 and 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 maybe well their software is pretty pretty much the same it's just a hardware difference right so but then when new changes are implemented in a software update, there have been times where we've had to learn new gesture patterns or... For iPhone uh, 10. Exactly. So those kinds of things uh, tend to, to impact you know, learners. To Taylor's point, and I get it, this is why we have itinerant services and we do go out into the rural areas where <clears throat> it may be more difficult for individuals to, to come to us. But access at that point is also one of the issues, whether it's access to you know, Wi-Fi and internet services uh, or access to an updated computer that would be able to accommodate the special software like JAWS or NVDA or a screen magnification or speech-to-text solution. And like um, Acapella's solution, Text Aloud, that's what it's called. Text Aloud, there you go. Well, the thing is, I think um, in addressing the the challenges, we have to we have to understand uh, more natural reader, natural reader as well. Yes, another another good tool, um, but you have to have systems that are able to Do operate that. with 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 because these programs are now very RAM hungry for even 
having Jaws uh, 2018, you, you need a system. Or 2019 Beta 2, mm -hmm. which is what I have. You need 4 gig of, of, of RAM. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you have to consider proximity of learner to, to training facility, if, that, if that's one, which is why we have the tech lab here, because we know if the learner comes here, we have a, a, a baseline, you know, of working units that we know we can go in and provide the training because we have access already here. But in folks' homes, that's not always the case. Could be, could yeah. be an right. issue, yeah. Do you have any other questions or anything, Taylor? So we both know that you sp that you are very knowledgeable. And one more <laughs> well, thing I want to know is what features of the Ronald Apex are to Windows CE and what features of the Ronald Apex are to the Keysoft? So anything that has key before it is going to be, as you know, a Keysoft, Keysoft. application. Right. Uh, and fortunately, what... Uh, what Humanware and all the other developers of electronic braille note takers have done, especially for the the BT or BX in some cases uh, devices, those are the six key devices, is that they've kept the keystrokes consistent for performing a variety of tasks, and and that has helped a lot of us uh, as we moved from one device to the other. Now to answer your question about keystrokes that <clears throat> that differ. What happens with the Braille Note Apex is that the Windows CE uh, platform is <coughs> developed for mobile devices. And so it really serves only to allow, number one, you to have that base operating system so that the unit will respond when compatible peripherals are attached to the device. So that's why you can use a thumb drive or connect your uh, oh, so Apex to a printer is because of the Windows CE platform running underneath. Keysoft is responsible for all of those programs that you you see with key in front of them. And so uh, Keysoft has integrated keystrokes from the Windows environment as well as some specific Keysoft keystrokes that, you know, which is why you have to learn the Keysoft keystrokes versus applying what you know from the Windows environment. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so with the Braille Note Touch, mm -hmm. you basically are, it's easier to distinguish because what is Keysoft and what is Android because there's a lot more Android and there's a lot more Keysoft. So, but with the Braille Note Apex, it's mostly Keysoft and a little bit of Windows CE. Yeah, yeah. Very little Windows CE on the Apex. Uh, it, because the, the intent is, uh, of course, to, to basically hide the, the Windows CE because its contribution in the in the usage is again to allow you to use those peripherals and other Windows based services that Keysoft uh, it does not have. No wonder why it's running on Eloquence as its default <laughs> synthesizer. Either way, yeah. um, so the Braille Note Touch, how come they're not hiding Android? Um, because they want you to be able to take advantage of switching between the modes. Uh, the, the, the Play Store, the, the downloadable apps. Right, so when you're in the when you're in the Android uh, mode and you're just using it as a standard tablet, right? Right. Then, then you you have access to using the gestures and all those kinds of things like that. Whereas when you're in the Keysoft environment, it's expected that you're going to be, you know, using the blind <coughs> features. Exactly. But the Keysoft is also incorporating Android, and the Android is also incorporating Keysoft. When you want a pure experience, you can move away from, you know, the the Keysoft and just use the tablet, you know, in its native mode, or or you can uh, have the option of uh, using Keysoft, uh, the integrated Keysoft Android approach, or just Keysoft. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, Mr. Cotton. We appreciate your time and your responses to our questions. You are very articulate, and oh, thank you, brother. You, uh, you surely know a lot about the different technologies, and we appreciate you sharing that with us. Oh, thank you. So, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This has been a presentation by Brilliant at Brilliant.org, where we are bridging the digital divide for the blind. If you like this video, please click the like button. And for more interesting videos, please subscribe to our channel.